And as I came, I just thought, this is such a diverse crowd. And so many young people here. Because I'm used to teaching older people. And I'm old myself, but I'm saying older than me people, right? <laughs> so, but young people, and you just remind me of my kids. So, um, they're a little younger than you, but two of them are in college. But, I, you know, you're, some of you are away from home probably studying, right? And I always say, if you're away from home, at least contact your mom. <laughs> The father's not that necessary, but the mom, right? Because this is Women's History Month. We have to remember who gave birth to you. <laughs> so it wasn't easy giving birth to my kids, and it's not easy raising them. But four years ago, I took my oldest to Korea, and then I left him there. He wanted to stay, so I left him there all summer, and I said, please call mom. Do you think he ever called mom? So I'm calling him all the time. Every time I call him, he's like, I'm in a rush. I said, what are you in a rush for? He stayed at Yonsei University, and they like, shut down at 10 o'clock or something. So if he doesn't get there by 10 p.m., he's locked out. So he's in a, I can't talk to you right now. I'm in a rush. <laughs> So I said, call me, call mommy when you are free. He's there all summer long, three days before he's coming home. <laughs> he calls me, and I'm like so excited. I said, oh my goodness, my son is calling me. <laughs> so I'm like, I can't even, like, it, I'm fumbling with my phone because I'm so excited. I'm like, I'm going to drop it. And I slide it over, and I say, hello. And the next thing he says is, Mom, I have no more money. <laughs> I said, you can't even say hello. You have to say, it's like an emergency situation, right? Because he's at the ATM machine, and he doesn't know the passcode. He's like, Mom, I have no money. What is my passcode? And I said, I can barely remember my own passcode. <laughs> How would I know your passcode? I said, the only person that will remember your passcode is your dad. So anyway, so he called his dad. But that's the only time he ever called me. So you guys on Women's History Month, but as every month, you know, er, as you said, every month, every, every day of the year, you should remember your mother. <laughs> and all the women. So we have a lot of women faculty in, in Gordon-Conwell, and I think that's wonderful that, you know, more and more seminaries, we're hiring more women, and that more women students are coming. You know, this is so exciting for me because, and I'm going to share a bit of my story. You know, I went to the seminary in the 90s, and you think 90s wasn't that long ago, but anyway, it was a long time ago, and a lot has happened since the 90s. And at that time, if, you, if a woman went to seminary, they would say, why? <laughs> why are you at seminary? And, you know, I got that throughout my whole MDiv and my whole PhD program, and even after I got it, People just couldn't accept me as someone who can teach. So that's always been a challenge for me. You know, how can you teach? So today's passage, I thought someone was going to read it, but I'll read it. I have a Bible passage. I don't know if the PowerPoint. You guys are so high tech here. Like, I've got this huge contraption on my head. <laughs> I've never seen such a contraption. I've seen the one year, but not this head thing. So if I look a little weird, it's just I feel awkward with this head contraption. But the passage I, um, that I had, I don't know if it has on the PowerPoint, is from Matthew 13, 31 to 32. So you can find it on your phone. <laughs> you know, I... What did we do? Like, some of you are so young, you don't know when we didn't have a cell phone. But I'm like, what did we do before the cell phone? Because I need my cell phone beside me, like when I'm preaching, 
when I am teaching, when I'm sleeping, just in case, you know. But, you know, it wasn't that long ago that we got cell phones. But I, I remember, you know, this is more of a, of a camera to me than my phone, but I need, like, my whole album just in case I have to show someone a picture of what I did a year ago. <laughs> so this is an amazing thing. So find it on your cell phone or whatever ha Bible that you have. So Matthew 13, 31 to 32. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. When a man took and planted in his field, though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. The other passage is Mark 4, 30 to 32. Gospel of Mark 4, 30 to 32. What shall we say the kingdom of heaven is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is a smallest seed you can plant in the ground. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants. When such big branches, with such big branches, that the birds of the air can perch in its shade. So the mustard seed, it says it's one of the smallest seeds in the world. You know, I live in this neighborhood, and my neighbors all think, like, either I never leave the house, or I'm never in the house, like I'm never home, because I'm never outside the house. So I've got neighbors who are just, you know, walking their dogs or out in the backyard enjoying their time. But for me, every time I'm outside, I either get bitten alive or the sun just scorches me and I get an allergic reaction. So that's why I'm not outside. But my husband is outside because I make him go outside <laughs> to do all the gardening. So <laughs> he's out there all the time. So either the neighbors think I hibernate all the time or I'm like the slave driver making my husband work. It's just because I can't go out there. So we got this nice, lovely garden, and I tell them every year what to plant and how to plant it, how to water it, <laughs> how to prune it. I tell them everything because I am such a good delegator. <laughs> my whole life I just delegate everybody what to do. So I actually know nothing about gardening, but in my head, I know everything. So I tell him what to do. And last year, he didn't listen to me because our crop was really, really bad. And I kept telling him, you're watering too much. And him and I argued. We argued about everything, but we argued about that. And at the end of the summer, we hardly had anything. So I said to him, too much water. <laughs> so now we're going to see what happens this summer, what happens, how much plant. But I told him, it's too much water. Too much. He's watering it. Like he gets up at 4 o'clock in the morning, and he can't wait to water the garden. And then by midday, he can't wait to go and water it again. I said, it's too much water. You're going to kill the plant. You're going to kill the plant. But here in the Bible, there's so many passages about harvesting and growing and everything else. Today, it's about the mustard seed. So I've never planted a mustard seed, and I've never told my husband to plant a mustard seed. But it says it's the smallest seed, and it's going to grow into this huge plant. When I think about it, that's, a, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? When I think about my own life, you know, I immigrated I was born in Korea, and I know there's a lot of Korean students here. I looked on the Gordon Conwell website, and there's like some Korean society or something. Is there? Maybe it's a secret society, but anyway, there's a Korean society. 
because we secretly want to rule the world, world. So anyway, but I know there's some Korean American fellowship or something. But I immigrated, I was born in Korea, immigrated in the 70s to Canada. I was a really small kid, and, and starting kindergarten, you know, I didn't know how to speak English. Everybody made fun of me. And, you know, I don't know how to speak English very well, and they called me names. And then they kept asking me. So in the 70s in Canada, if you can imagine, some of you are too young. They kept saying to me, what are you? So I said, I'm Korean. And these little Canadian kids kept saying, there's no such thing as Korean. I think America will be a little different because you guys went into war, right? You, you were part of the Korean War. So maybe some American kids will know about Korea, right? And you guys grew up with MASH, the older people, right? <laughs> But in Canada, I was in this small little town, and they said, there's no such thing as Korea. So then I was in shock. I thought maybe my mom was wrong. So I went home and I said, there's no such thing as Korea or Korean. Because I was crying and crying, and then she said, we're from Korea, you were born in Korea, you are Korean. So I would run back and then, you know, everybody's making fun of me, racism was rampant, and they said, there's no such thing as Korean. There's Chinese, and there's Japanese, but no Korean. So it was hard growing up, and actually later in life I went to Hawaii, and I know in Hawaii, people thought that, you know who they thought Koreans were? They thought Koreans were when a Chinese married a Japanese, <laughs> that their kid was Korean. So anyway, everybody's all confused. But I said, I'm Korean. So everybody kept asking me, what are you? So racism was rampant. And I grew up, I was really weak. I was so weak. I had, my nose was bleeding all the time. And you know, I was so embarrassed sitting in class. And my nose would bleed. And I would like, cover myself and have to run to the bathroom and be in there for like 30 minutes trying to stop it. One time I was home, it, I was bleeding so much that I had to take me to the hospital. An ambulance came because I, my parents thought I was just going to die like just losing blood. And I was so weak, my, um, my arm dislocated all the time as a kid. So in Korean, you know, my, my appa would say, you know, 팔, 팔, 팔 do you know what that is for the Korean people? 팔 떨어졌어, right? And they would say, you know, you left it way behind there, because he would just joke with me that I lost my arm and I left it way back there, so I have to go back and get it, right? <laughs> So he goes, 팔저 가지러 가라고. And then he says, because it's falling off all the time, just put it in your pocket. <laughs> so you think, what can this small little immigrant girl do? And then I remember my English was so poor, but grade four, I don't think they do this anymore because my kids never did this. Grade four, there was a mandatory public speaking. Did anyone grow up with that? in your classroom, it was the most terrifying thing. It, it has like, I have nightmares thinking about that. So there you are, like a grade four, and you can't even speak English. Now you have to do a speaking thing for five minutes in front of the class. The only thing you can take up are these little cue cards that you can make. But by the time I got up there, I was sweating so much that everything melted in my hands. And that's how I was. So everybody being racist outside. And then I would go to church, and sexism is so rampant, right? All the women in here know. What, are women, what can women do in the church? You know, without the woman, maybe there would have been no church. Without the woman, no spreading of the gospel. The women were so important around Jesus. You know, sometimes we got to read the scripture against the grain. You know, in the Asian culture, we rarely give names to women or the women's stories are forgotten. No-name woman. There's a story of a no-name woman. 
So we have to remember how some of the women's names aren't given in Scripture, and that many's, many women's stories are lost. And we think, as women, we're so small. What can we do? What can we do as an immigrant who experienced so much racism, xenophobia everywhere? You know, a few years ago when on United Air, when that Chinese doctor was beaten up, do you remember that? When he was beaten up and pulled out of a seat, my son, that never called me, he actually called me. <laughs> and he says, Mom, are you going to write about that? Because he knows I write about a lot of things. He gets me to write because, and then even after, you know, Parasite won. Has anyone watched Parasite, the movie Parasite? Actually, my son kept telling me it's such a scary movie. I, I didn't watch it. And then the night of the Oscars, was the night I was actually flying to Vegas. So I'm on this long flight. There's nothing to watch. So I go to the foreign category. The only foreign movie in there on United Air was Parasite. So I thought, okay, I'll just watch it. I know my son said I'm going to get scared, but I'll watch it. And it was so entertaining to me. I'm like, why did my son say it was, it was going to be scary? You see, I turned it on too late. that I, The last 25 minutes, I couldn't watch it. It's the last 25 minutes that's scary, right? Because I had to get off the plane, and then the Oscars happened, and they won. And then, so, I, go, I texted my daughter. I said, where can I watch it for free? Because she knows all the free sites. So I watched the rest of that. <laughs> I watched the rest of it, and that's when it was scary, right? So if you didn't watch it, you have to go out and watch. And then, so, the next day, my son said, are you going to write about it? So I said, I'm not going to write about it. I'm in Vegas. What am I going to write about? But then, because he said it, I wrote about it. So if you want to read my writing, it's on the Christian Century, on Parasite. But that day when he asked me, are you going to write about it, when that Chinese doctor was beaten up, I was going to write about it, but I couldn't write about it. Why? Because it was so close to my own experiences. My parents had a variety store, as many of the immigrants did, Korean-American immigrants. And I've seen people, customers, come in. I looked tall. Actually, I was taller than Al, oh, because I just met my friend, and we were the same height, and I shrunk two inches over the years. So I was actually taller than I am now. But my dad is really short. He's like probably 5'2". So he's a really short man. Customers beat him up. Customers got a bottle of water and just threw it at him. And you wonder why. There's no reason they just did it and they thought it was funny. Because it's easy to do it to people that are the other or who you make the other. So that time when that happened, I couldn't write it because it was too close to home. So when we think about society and we, the, the American country we live in, racism and sexism happening, we ask ourselves, what can we do as Christians? The passage was, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed when a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. We may be sitting here thinking, we're so small. What can I do? You know, I'm a minority or I'm a woman or I'm so young. What can I do? You know, there's stories, of fantastic stories of what women in the past and other people have done in the past. You know, there was a young woman from Albania who was teaching and then she decided to go to India to serve the poorest of the poor. 
right? And then she started, she set up a place to help those who are homeless, those who are dying, those who had leprosy, who had illness. I actually visited that place in India. It's Missionaries of Charity. And the woman is Mother Teresa. You know, she started in 1950 with 12 members. She's actually a very tiny woman. I never met her. It was my hope and dream to meet her. I never met her. Today, there's over 4,500 members. You know, there are homes and places around the world, over 133 countries where these places, missionaries of charity, are set up to help the poor, the homeless, the orphans. Miracles happen. A small mustard seed grows into a big plant. A small young woman who had nothing goes and does great things in the world. You ask yourself, you know, yesterday, you know, I'm much younger than Dr. Johnson, right? <laughs> He's not that old, but I'm much younger. I can barely keep up with him. He, we were like running around Boston. And I was like, you know, I just pretended I'm okay, but I, it was hard to keep up with him. And I'm much younger than him. But one of the places, we went to like a zillion places, and, and one of them was Park Street Church. So you probably all know Park Street Church. And there was a plaque of all the missionaries. They couldn't even fit all the people. All the missionaries that went out in the world. You know, God calls us to do things. And we think, you know, I'm too tiny. You know, I don't have enough gifts. What can I do? But these missionaries go out, and then the person that was, I'm so bad with names, but I think it was Carol. Was it? She showed us the list of, like, Bible translations like in different languages, I think that's incredible that people can go around the world and the Bible can be translated into so many languages. So we think, what can we do? You know, when we think about the seed, the seed is a living seed. We think it's dead, right? But it's a living seed. The mustard seed, the tiniest seed is a living seed. And when you plant it, it bears fruit. It bears fruit. That tiny seed is like us. You know, God plants us and we are to bear fruit. The scripture talks about the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And as seminary students, you know them probably better than me. And you probably know the scriptures better than me too. But the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the fruits of the Spirit. And as Gordon Conwell, you guys are celebrating 50 years of faithfulness. I think that is so amazing. And I hope there's 50 plus more years of faithfulness and bearing fruits of the Spirit. Everything starts out small, but we bear the fruit. That's what the mustard seed is. It's not a dead seed. It's not a dead thing. It's a living thing, and it grows and it bears fruit, and great things can come out of that mustard tree. So here, we are this little mustard seed. You know, I was this scrawny little kid with the arm falling off all the time, with nose bleeding, all the time. My nose bled all the time. I had to carry boxes of tissue with me just in case it happened. And God can use someone like me. God can use you. You know, this racism and this fear of the other is so embedded in our culture today. You know, we want to build that big wall Actually, the wall is already there. I've taken students to the wall. But Trump wants a bigger wall, right? And we want to build walls everywhere. 
and as a Korean, you know, it's, people are racist towards us and then we are afraid of other people too. So I grew up, I was born in South Korea, but I grew up fearing North Korea, right? So in Korea, they teach everybody. The word that we use is bargaining, which means a commie. So the, you know, the commies are going to come and kill us or get us, right? So they keep telling us to be afraid of North Koreans because they're going to come and kill all of us, right? They're going to take everything from us. You know, the scripture teaches us to love our enemies, to love one another. Love is one of the fruits of the Spirit. But sometimes it's so hard to love, isn't it? Sometimes even the closest people around us, we, it's so hard to love. That's why the divorce rate is so high. Right? It's so hard to love. So here, you know, we are to love our enemies. About four or five years ago, I was working with Reverend Jackson on the Kenneth Bay case. If you remember Kenneth Bay, he was um, in prison in North Korea. He was an American citizen, but he went to North Korea. He went several times, and then one of those times they arrested him. And he was in prison for a long time. So we were trying to get him out. So one of the ways we were going to get him out was meeting with certain um, heads of state and ambassadors and so forth. And one of them was this North Korean ambassador to the UN. He's an unofficial there's an unofficial place for him. So Ambassador Jang. So I said, nah. I said to Reverend Jackson, no problem, I can go meet him. Right? And then as the weeks got closer and closer, I thought, oh no. Because I was taught that, you know, they're my enemy, that they're going to come and kill me, they're going to come and get me. So if I've already been on the phone conversation with Ambassador Jang, so I thought, now he knows my cell phone, right? With cell phone, you can find anybody in the world. So now I know, oh no, he's gonna, he knows where I live, right? He's going to come and kill not just me, but my whole family now, right? So as the weeks get close, I'm just getting nervous and nervous and nervous. I said, because you're taught. And the morning of, I almost like had a panic attack, and I thought, I won't be able to go because I was so afraid once he sees me, he may even kill me in his office, because that's how I thought, right? So I was so nervous, my hands were sweaty, just like grade four, hands were sweaty, and I thought, what am I going to do? So we went into the office building in the UN, they have all these different buildings, and I entered the office, and I then we started speaking in Korean, and I thought, they're just like my brothers and sisters. You know, we build up this fear of our enemies and of each other, of foreigners. We get so afraid. You know, some, some churches get so afraid of women preaching. I don't know why, but they get so afraid of women preaching or teaching. But once you see that we are created by God. That we're brothers and sisters, there's nothing to be afraid of. That was four or five years ago, I'm still alive. They're not gonna come and kill me. <laughs> but here are the fruits of the Spirit. In Joel 2.28, um, it says, you know, I will pour my Spirit upon all people. It's not just Americans, not just Canadians, among all people. The, the Spirit is poured upon all people. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, pace, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We are to love. And not be afraid of those who are so different from us. Not be afraid of women preaching and teaching and sharing the good news without the woman, where would, be, where, where would we be? So during this uh, Women's History Month, remember that our mothers, our foremothers, and those who taught us the good news. Right? Usually it's the mothers that teach us the Bible and our Bible stories. So we remember them in our prayer. 
And during this time where we think about the fruit of the Spirit, that we are to go out into the world, no matter how small we are or how small we feel, that the Spirit is upon us and miracles do happen. Let us all bow our heads in prayer. Gracious and loving God, thank you so much for this seminary, for the 50 years of faithfulness, for all the students and staff and faculty, for all the alumni, for all the students that have gone by past these walls, we give you thanks. For all the wonderful things that they are doing in this Boston area and beyond and around the world, we give you thanks for all the students that have made an impact by sharing the good news. And some of us may feel small and insignificant. Give us your strength. Pour your spirit upon us and strengthen us so that we may go out into the world and make an impact, that we can share the good news boldly, that we can go out and love our enemies, love those that we fear so much. In your son's precious name we pray. Amen.